Whether we like it or not, suffering colors our lives. One of the oldest of humankind's questions is, why do bad things happen to good people? Or why does God allow suffering? The usual answers to that question involve lots of faulty assumptions, like, well, there is no God, or if there is, he just doesn't care. Or we assume, as we saw in our look at reaping and sowing, that if we're good people, we deserve good. And if we're bad, we should get what's coming to us. And sometimes we blame it all on Satan, or chalk it up to a sign the end is near. But the Bible isn't that simplistic. For thousands of years, the wisest minds among us have been grappling with this puzzle. So if you think you're going to get the answer from me, you don't know me very well. But what I can offer is some insight into what suffering is not and how God expects us to respond to it when it does come our way. And I'm going to focus on the book of Job, which doesn't say everything you might expect it to. The book of Job is a complex and unique Bible story that has puzzled believers for thousands of years. It's unusual because it's set in the land of Uz, an unknown land far away from the land of Israel. Job and all the characters are non-Israelites, and there's no clear historical setting, so we don't know when the story takes place. All of that may be intentional, so we don't get distracted by the details and can focus on the important questions raised by Job's suffering. Now, as the story opens, we're introduced to Job, who's blameless, righteous, and honors God in every way. In fact, God boasts about him as he's holding court in the heavenly realms, which is a common theme in the Old Testament. And one of the heavenly beings with God is a figure called the Satan, which in Hebrew means the accuser or the prosecutor. The Satan is where we get the word Satan. But Satan isn't a name, it's a title. And at this point in the Bible narrative, he's not the devil. He's actually on God's team. And as I said, his role seems to be like that of an investigator, or more precisely, a prosecuting lawyer, like a crown attorney who tries to get a conviction in court. And the Satan doesn't start this whole thing. It's actually God who brings Job to his attention. God says to the Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, who's blameless and righteous? The Satan challenges that and says, Well, Job is only righteous because you reward him. Let him suffer, and then we'll see how righteous he is. So God agrees to let the prosecutor inflict punishment on Job. And of course, our first response to that is, Why would God allow that to happen? We assume the book will answer that very serious dilemma. But... Despite what you may have heard over the years, it doesn't. Instead, it concentrates on bigger questions like, is God just? And does he run the world according to the principles of justice? Those answers come at the end of the book, but even Job never learns why he suffers, because God never tells him. So even Job's wife says, curse God so he'll kill you and get this suffering over with. Then three of Job's friends show up to offer comfort and counsel. Their names are Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Zophar, Zogood. The main part of the book is a dialogue between Job and his three friends about what God is like and why he does the things he does. But the three make a huge assumption. They assume that if you're good, good things happen to you. And if you're evil, evil things come your way. But Job rejects that, saying he is not guilty, that he is not being punished by God. And you know what? He's right. We're told at the very beginning of the book that Job is blameless and righteous. But his friends say, no, that can't be true. You must have done something really, really bad to get what's happening to you. They even make a list of potential sins he's probably guilty of. After all, Job loses his animals and income to enemy raiders. A storm flattens a house, killing his ten children. And Job himself is inflicted with painful boils from head to toe. In the beginning, he finds a level of acceptance. I came naked from my mother's womb, and I'll be naked when I leave, he says. 
The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all of this, the Bible says, Job said nothing wrong. But he's like us, and over time, discouragement and despair set in. And rightfully so. Remember, he doesn't deserve any of this. So Job's protest while he's on this emotional roller coaster is that he used to think God was just, but now he asks, why has God denied me justice and made my life bitter? God attacks me, tears me up in anger, and gnashes his teeth at me. Job even widens it out, saying he destroys the blameless and the wicked. He mocks the despair of the innocent. So Job makes one last statement asserting his innocence, then demands God explain himself. I sign my defense, he says. Let the Almighty answer me. Notice again the echoes of a law trial. In fact, at one point, Job says, God is not a mortal like me, so I can't argue with him or take him to trial. If only there was a mediator between us, someone who could bring us together. The mediator could make God stop beating me, and I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him without fear, but I can't do that in my own strength. And then a guy named Elihu shows up. He's no mediator, but he does have a more sophisticated understanding of suffering. He says, perhaps it's not a punishment for sin, past or present. Maybe God uses suffering to warn us away from sin in future or to build our character. And there are hints of that elsewhere in the scriptures. We can rejoice when we run into problems and trials, for we know they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strong character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And that hope won't lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because He's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. Then God answers Job from a whirlwind, which must have been an absolutely terrifying experience. After all, it was scandalous for any mere mortal to question the justice of God. The Lord asks, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself, because I have some questions for you, and you're going to answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb and as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in deep darkness? For I locked it behind barred gates limiting its shores. I said, this far and no further will you go. Here, your proud waves must stop. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made light spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night? As the light approaches, the earth takes shape like clay pressed beneath a seal. It's robed in brilliant colors. Have you explored the springs from where the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Do you know where the gates of death are located? Have you seen the gates of utter gloom? Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell me if you know. But of course you know all this, for you were born before it was all created, and you're so very experienced. Have you visited the storehouses of the snow, or seen the storehouses of hail? Who created a channel for the torrents of rain, 
and laid out a path for the lightning. Who sends rain to satisfy the parched ground and make the tender grass spring up? Can you direct the movement of the stars? Can you direct the constellations through the seasons? Do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? Who is wise enough to count all the clouds? Can you stop prey for a lioness and satisfy the young lion's appetites? Have you watched as deer are born in the wild? Their young grow up in the open fields. Is it at your command that the eagle rises to the heights to make its nest? It lives on the cliffs, making its home on a distant rocky crag. From there, it keeps watch with piercing eyes, just as from on high, God keeps watch. That scolding must have been absolutely withering, but God does not put Job in his place. Instead, he puts Job in God's place so that at least momentarily, he can see how complicated and complex it is to run the universe with the principles of justice. He wants this man to see that there is so much that he doesn't know or comprehend. The universe is a vast and complex thing and God has his eye on all of it as he orders and sustains life. But Job has only a speck of perspective based on his microscopic life experience. So what looks like injustice from Job's point of view needs to be seen in a much wider context that he can't hope to understand. In other words, Job's in no position to accuse God of anything. In fact, God says, if you're so smart, how about you rule the world and give everybody exactly what they deserve? Give vent to your anger. Let it overflow against the proud. Walk on the wicked where they stand. Bury them in the dust and imprison them in the world of the dead. But Job responds with humility. I was talking about things I know nothing about, he says, things too wonderful for me. I had only heard about you before, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. What's interesting is that God is not angry at Job. He's mad at the friends. He says to them, Job has spoken accurately about me, and you have not, because your answers are too simple for my complex world. Now, that is not to say that everything Job says is right but God honors his struggle and his honesty and says, yes, this is the way to confront suffering, by being upfront with it and by trusting me, even when you don't understand what's going on. As the story wraps up, God restores to Job everything he lost during his suffering, his health, his wealth, his reputation, and his children. In fact, God gives him double what he had in the beginning not as a reward for passing some test, as we tend to think, but simply as a gift to show Job his love. So the story of Job is not meant to have an answer to why bad things happen to good people. Instead, it invites us to trust God's wisdom when we encounter suffering, instead of trying to figure out the reasons behind it. Because when knowing is our focus, we tend to simplify God like Job's friends or accuse him based on limited knowledge, as Job did. The better way is to bring our pain to God in honesty and humility and trust that he not only cares, but knows what he's doing. And there are some other lessons to recap. First, Suffering is not always because of sin. Yes, the Bible says we can suffer the consequences of sin and that God sometimes disciplines us like any loving father. But much of sin in this world won't be addressed until the day of judgment. 
So when you suffer, don't ask, why me? Any more than you would when good things come your way. Be like the Jewish rabbis who said, why not me? Because they knew that suffering was just part of life. And if you're going to help somebody else with their suffering, you've got to make sure to do it right. Be like the friends of Job who, when they first arrive, spend days just sitting with him in empathy and solidarity. It's only when they start to judge him that they get into trouble. Instead, we need to just be there with people in the midst of their suffering and to offer whatever support we can. Because we don't always get in this life what we deserve, not good or bad. Number two, we don't get what we deserve because we do have a mediator between us and God, just like Job yearns for. Paul writes, pray for all people. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Third, we encounter Christ in suffering, just like Job. Remember what he said? I had only heard about you before, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. Suffering opens our eyes of faith and helps us experience God. Paul says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to receive the heavenly prize for which God is calling us. Suffering has an amazing capacity to show us what's important and what's not. All of a sudden, the things that were so vital when times were good just don't matter anymore. We come to appreciate our health, the people who love us, and the God who's in control. And sometimes, as Paul reminds us, we just have to look forward to a place where there will be no suffering. Fourth, Eliphaz was right. Suffering does build character. When trouble arises, see it as an opportunity for great joy, says James. For when your faith is tested, your endurance can grow. So let it. And when it's fully developed, you'll be mature and complete. God blesses those who endure testing and temptation. They'll receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love Him. If you think about it, the story of Job is a good parallel to ours. All of us suffer to some degree. There's pain, loss, and sorrow. But like Job's new relationship with God, our reliance on Him eventually brings renewal and restoration in heaven with much more than we ever lost. In the meantime, we should be more grateful when we don't suffer, and we should take better care of the good things around us, including the creation God speaks so lovingly of when He challenges Job. And we should show greater empathy to those in the fires of adversity. Love each other with genuine affection, says Romans 12, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. But above all, we need humility and trust, recognizing situations that seem so clear cut to us may not be, because we don't have the wisdom, knowledge, and love of God. So he wants us to put our confidence in him, especially when we don't understand, because he really does have our best interest at heart in a vast, complicated universe. The bottom line is that suffering will color your life, but you get to choose the color.